You're listening to the Lone Star Play Podcast with your host, Patrick Scott Armstrong. I'd like to know this name, though. Uh, what's the story on that? That's the one question I know the answer to. <laughs> Here they are right now. They're from Corpus Christi, Texas. They are called the Pozo Cinco Singers. Feel this whole room love that you're singing Peter Paul and Mary songs, Dylan songs. It was the age of folk music at its height. And to me, she was the, the voice of the Pozo Seco singers. She wasn't the girl singer. She was more than that. She was the lead singer. Once Albert Grossman, our manager, signed Janice, that really changed everything. Folk music was no longer pop music. And when your stage became standing on a bar, it just didn't feel right. Just an old I think she was pretty burned by the business and had just sort of said, that's it, I'm not gonna do that anymore. I know that I'm at the age, being an artist at this point is, I want to just write as best I can, maybe songs that have some meaning to others that move them, maybe some that just give them solace. Like wheel, songs are about life to me in folk music. That's what it's always been about. Being able to survive and not having to depend on being famous to me it was a gift. Every year is like when you were a kid, it was a challenge, right? Because you didn't know how to tie your shoes. So you had to learn all these things. When, you, when you're when you like, you know, my age now, you already learned all that. Now you just have to learn how to keep your body up. <laughs> but it's the same old thing. It's like, no wonder they think kids are like old people. Old people like kids. Because, yeah, you're right. We're It's the same. Never did this before. Okay. <laughs> Oh, that's hilarious. Listen, after watching this documentary, I wouldn't guess that, girl. You got so much hustle in you. I'm telling you. I see well, you setting up tables in that thing, carrying your guitar <laughs> cases, running around. My, who is this lady? Oh, yeah, my God. Remember, remember in the, when, you get to the, when you get to the end of the documentary, I'm like putting tables up in the little in the house concert that we actually had going at that time. And then COVID yeah. hit. Yeah. Oh, uh, and, oh, and all of a sudden two years go by. So, well, I'm thinking that and I'm thinking, hey, guys, just understand when that thing was like being made, I was like four years younger than I am. <laughs> <laughs> and just like a kid, it makes a lot of difference. Makes a lot of difference now too. those four years. So, yeah. Fair enough. Fair enough. Yeah, I did. You know, I, I actually, as I was watching it, I didn't notice that aspect of the timeline till the very end when it hit 2018. I was like, oh. Okay, this was before the pandemic. Uh, yeah, which is yeah. Crazy. And then everything crazy. kind of stopped. I mean, even we we had things to finish on it, like little things, you know, that the writer and the director wanted to say. Now that we're looking at it and seeing what footage we're going to pick, because these guys followed me around for like three years. Um, oh wow! Once, yeah, I was like that because. Wow. You know, once it seemed like that, by the time we really finished, it was three years before yeah. we got a cut that we all went like, yeah, I went, wow, wow. I'm like, I'm blown away by what you guys did. You, The two women who edited it, I think, really pulled a lot from too much to me film. But uh, I went to Folk Alliances and they followed me around with the camera at Folk Alliances. So people got to see the Southeast Regional Folk Alliance one year. And then the next year we did the International Folk Alliance in Kansas City. That's where I was carrying all that stuff around. Okay. That'll about get your muscles going. I mean, those guys, I said, this is the last year I'm coming here unless y'all have golf carts. That's it. <laughs> <laughs> I don't blame you. I, I do not blame you. No, it, 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 it was hard. It was hard. Ann McHugh, I don't know if you know Annie, she lives over in Nashville and she's one of the people in it on the stage at Liberty. Well, Annie became a friend of mine. She's originally from Australia, was a rocker, but now kind of does, she does all kinds of things. She's a wonderful talent, great songwriter, great guitar player. And uh, she sees me coming out of the hall with all that stuff and she's with somebody, she says, hi, hey, so how you doing? I said, well, you know, Oh, let us help you to your room. So I always had friends like her that were there that went, well, poor pie has got to drag all that stuff up there. So I had totally I had people there, but uh, yeah. It, You're it like, was, I wish I just good. played harmonica. That would be so much easier, right? <laughs> That's just carry the that around. 
stuck with to the end. And you know what? We're breathing when we do it. So it's a good practice. Absolutely. Go. I, listen, there I you saw go. you in the documentary crushing the harmonica. I was like, this lady's amazing. You're amazing. <laughs> Really? I mean that. Uh, yes, Taylor, thank you so much for coming on the show today. Th oh, this wow. is amazing. Thanks for inviting me. Are you kidding me? Um, I watched the documentary this morning. I, I actually like to, anytime I do this and I have to watch a documentary or a show or a movie or something, I actually like to do it right before I'm going to do the interview. It's fresh in me. I feel all the energy from it. And yeah, as I was watching, I just thought, okay, uh, first of all, you just have this great energy about you that I love and it's contagious. And I just thought, oh man, th this person's, this is going to be a great documentary. I, I, no matter what this is about or whatever, I just want to hang out with this woman and find out more about her. Um, so yes, congratulations. Y'all did a great job on putting this um, together. Thank you. Thank you. I, th I think that it was really well done because honestly, when a, my friend in Fredericksburg, Texas, who we started Puff Funny Records together along with Evan Wood from down in Corpus area, um, when she discovered where I had disappeared to in a lot of people's eyes after the Pozo Seco, well, whatever happened to Susan? You know, well, you know, it was like, I did a lot of things. I helped Don get his <laughs> career started. Uh, yeah, just one I of those things. Of, yeah. I mean, I, mean, I, was, I was never not busy, guys. I just, <laughs> you know. <laughs> Maybe not For doing me, what they thought you should be doing. Oh, or something, gosh, right? it's amazing how people are so married to fame. And, and sure. it never felt that great to me. Maybe it was because I was a woman. I'm so glad that it was good for Don. I can tell he was really happy there, but, but it's different when you're six foot three and you're a guy and it's very different when you're a woman. And I was only 19 years old. I think Donnie Ray was, uh, he was 26. I can't remember how often, I think he was 20 something, but I was like 16 years old when we started playing music together and practicing our songs and having all been raised in the same religious kind of circles, there was no uh instruments in our upbringing on music when you went to church everybody sang in parts uh, yeah. so the, so me and donnie and lofton had this thing when we sat down to sing where we just made up our parts and if one if one person said wait a minute or what do you say are you singing ah, right there and i go yeah i'm singing and he's like, okay but i said but you take that one and i'll go uh, uh okay talking, no problem and then we just keep going forward so you know and then we get signed by manager <laughs> Mr. Plus, you know, Albert Grossman in New York, who was head of all the folk pop at that moment in life and all of the traditional folk artists too and writers. And he signed the group to when we went with Columbia and life changed drastically. All these people who I had admired and had their records and used to get licks off of Bias's albums, you know, I just suddenly you're meeting these people up. You're just, sure. you're in the same camp in the same yeah. stable. I wow. was absolutely shell shocked. I mean, I was sure. like the kid going, "Whoa!" Of course. I got, what year was that, by the way, that you guys got signed? Do you remember? I think that was like we we put we put time out on a local label down there in Corpus, Edmark Records, in what sixty? I just graduated from high school. That was sixty five. So it was like we put the record out that summer. I wow. graduated. We went to Houston. We cut it there at Gold Star which part of that studio, you know, was in it now. They, isn't that guy a hood who runs it now? Who, oh my gosh. He was great. Uh, <laughs> he was about so the singing naked and the, uh, in the, th right. Yeah. <laughs> I've actually and visited, then, uh, then, I visited that studio. The story of having the rolling stones. Yes. The rolling, the rolling stones. That was and he so said, cool. There's no tape in it. <laughs> That's so, actually, you asked the best question, which was maybe it's in another box. Why wouldn't you check these <laughs> other boxes? Hello. It got misplaced or they took it or, or someone else <laughs> found it probably. Right. And was like taking yeah, these to the yeah, private yeah. stash. It was, it was really fun doing all that stuff, going to Corpus and seeing that happen. Uh, of course. Really cool. Absolutely. How, how did y'all even, so I, I think in the documentary, it's mentioned how y'all are maybe at some, an event or something and y'all are backstage and like, okay, this sounds good. Let's go out and perform. That literally was y'all's first like live performance together. That moment that y'all talk about. Um, I can't from... remember what part in the documentary it is. Don Williams brings it up. It's in an interview y'all are doing on TV, right? It's old school footage and, and he's being interviewed. It's two gentlemen. I don't remember. Oh, the show. right. It was on the Mike Douglas show. That's it. 
that's it. And he he asked him, he's like, yeah, we were backstage or something. And I, I can't, you know, yeah, well, like that, I, I thought, yeah. you know, I, I gave I gave Don a lot of license on that because by then people had asked that question a lot. And so sure. I felt like he condensed it. And no, we didn't go sure. right from there. No, actually, we met at the Hootenanny at Del Mar College because I was going to go on uh, after these guys. I was sort of like a, in high school at Ray playing the, the you know, the guy who wrote time and i had a folk group and we were members of the corpus christi folk music society we were like the beginning charter members of it we were just kids and another guy was a principal of a elementary school and there was a an engineer who was working on in the petroleum industry i mean that guy's name was pete rose and he's the one who mentioned pozo seco because he because i asked him once i said what's that map of out there in the gulf and he said well these are all oil wells and i said well, what's that ps mean next to that when he said well it means postal seco which means it's a dry well and i thought that's kind of a cool thing in a way i'm not sure why but yeah I, I think it is talking. a i think it is an intriguing name um and it, it's it even kind of comes up in the documentary right where a lot of people are asking um and yeah, Dick clark even that, mentions yeah. like oh i don't am i think i'm saying it right but i've heard it a, a thousand times on the radio differently uh, oh, we even got great. called the Pecos Bill Singers. <laughs> what? What? <laughs> yeah, that was my favorite. The Pecos, Pecos Bill. Bill. What? Pecos Bill. Where the heck did they get that? <laughs> I haven't heard that name in 30 years. Holy cow. That's you hilarious. Know, it's sort of like amazing how people don't, didn't really listen back then. And they, we may have gotten worse. <laughs> 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 I'm not oh, really man. sure, but I, I love that y'all chose chose that name. Um, to be honest with you, I, I think that's cool. Um, uh, you know, just said something about y'all. It stuck it stuck out for y'all, I'm sure, during that time. Uh, were there a lot of people using names like that of like different languages? I mean, I'm I'm actually half Mexican. My mom's from Mexico uh, City, so that to me is cool. I, I find that kind of stuff intriguing. Oh, I like the story you told, right? Yeah, right. Yeah, like you're yeah. down from the I, down I south. Loved, uh, I, I, lo I love living in Corpus. My favorite place to go, you know, being in high school was when we could get a weekend off and somebody had enough money to get gas was go to the border. What we were like from Corpus, we could go down Roundsville, whatever, and go across. And, yeah. And we, it was just fun to be able to sure. go across and drink tequila, man, you know, because you yeah. didn't have to be. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> I know yeah, those, those were great yes, times. Yes, great yes, yes. <laughs> That's great. No, I, I love that so much. Um, yeah. So, and then you guys dropped the singers part, right, later, but maybe not. I mean, it's kind of, do you want people to include that in the name when they say it to you, or you don't care, you know? It doesn't, it doesn't matter. matter if you were really paying attention. I was one of those being the folkies. We're always archiving things. It's not the yeah. idea of which is what Puff Bunny Records is really all about. It was to say when my friend Kathy said, well, nobody's really heard of you in so long. You need to make an album. You're doing this and that and you're writing and your stuff is great. So she funded the album. And I said, well, the only way you're going to get any money back, because I've been in the music business, is if you have a label and you make it important. So I would recommend that you just start a little label. And you can make it however you want it. Put this on your label. And then it got into archiving everything I had in all my library. You know, why not yeah. do that? And then I said, yeah, but, you know, nobody's just going to be interested in this label if all you got on it is me. You need to branch out and do other things. And that's kind of, we started out that way 15 years ago. And now I think our, our library is not big. But I'm really proud of how we have evolved uh, to the extent that now if a product, we don't we never did sign artists. We just said, hey, we'd like to put out a record on you or, or if somebody would bring me a project and I'd say, man, do you have a label yourself? And if you're not, you know, like Mike, Michael O'Connor, I buddy that I traveled around, you know who Michael is from Corpus, the guitar player, uh -oh. played plays the Austin area a lot, plays a lot with Plankenhorn. Jeff Plankenhorn, maybe you heard that name up in I've the I've heard Austin that name area. for sure. Well, yeah. Jeff and Michael were like my first two guys that I got with he and George Inslee and Greg Whitfield. These guys were willing to start this thing with me that I called Song Swarm, which I started for the label to say, look, let's see what it is as songwriter performers. We write our songs and we solo sing them ourselves. I have a lot of trouble getting gigs as a solo female artist. I, wow. I even had 
the wife of the owner of one down in the New Bronzeville area, let's say, that Mike Michael got us. And, and Plank and Mike, you know, O'Connor Mock, they said, we play this place all the time. I said, I have sent my CD to them and I've never gotten a gig there. Let's go do a song swarm. So we explained to people, a song swarm is when performers, musician, songwriter, performers, meaning you got to write the song, get on a stage, they promise they will not rehearse. So you can't rehearse. If you rehearse, you're cheating. Doesn't mean oh, you can't wow. play on doesn't mean you can't have played on stage with these people before because sure. they're the first ones who invited me to that great place that was the listening room in Austin that closed down for a while. It was a little coffee shop thing and this uh can't think of the name right now. But anyway, it's gone. But they invited me to come and play with them. And we had a blast. We never rehearsed. And I love that idea. They were good enough. And I was good enough. Because if I couldn't play guitar good enough, I could pick up my harmonica. Yeah. Oh, and give it one. <laughs> you know, I, I always had enough. I was a percussionist in school. So I had my little box of tools. I could shake a shaker. I could slap my knees. I could do something. But that oh was gosh. the idea of a song swarm is that. It's not a song round where the guy next to you really hopes you don't play because you're probably going to mess up his song. Or don't, That's please so don't cool. sing with me. Yeah, you know, yeah, absolutely. You, no, you encourage play. it. Yeah, exactly. You, yeah. you have to. You're not yeah. a real song swimmer if you don't contribute something to that person's song, That's whether so you've ever cool. heard it or not. And That's so usually what happens when you're jamming with people in a room hanging out, right? That's what happens. Exactly. When you're not thinking that, you know, when you're not thinking. Perfect. Yep. Yeah, and the absolutely. audience ate it up. Plank and Horn came to me after that particular gig where the woman told me that they didn't hire female acts who were soloists because they were boring. And I said, Oh, I'm sorry. What? And then I oh my then I went off <laughs> and did my thing with the guys, you know, those two guys on each side of you. It works beautifully. But Plank and Horn wrote me an email after that particular gig and said, You know, Pi, open it for Joe Eli, playing with all the people I played. And now, of course, he's got his own thing going, which is really great. He said, I've never sold as many CDs as we sold because I just said, everybody just let's just dump all of our CDs in the middle of a table and let's have a price. How about 10 bucks, guys? They're all here. They're out. Let's just sell them all. for. And if you buy four, you can have it for 35. So Plank and Horn kept the statistics. And at the end of it, he said, I sold more CDs on that show that night than I have ever sold opening for a big name guy or whatever wow. or my own thing. I sold more. And I said, well, that proves to my point. You take some good songwriter performers who really like, like each other and enjoy each other's company. And they're not worried about being perfect. They want to be good on this song. And we're yeah. all professionals enough to be able to do that. If you'll listen. First. Sure. Sure. Absolutely. And it was beautiful. Wow. That's and amazing. it still is. Yeah. Absolutely. I hope to do one when I come down there in March, you know, I'm supposed to go to Corpus with the documentary in March. I think I'll try to put a song swarm together somewhere in Corpus while I'm down there. Because if even if this hand, which has got the carpal tunnel thing, stop that, <laughs> going bad, can't do it. I can still put that harmonica and I can still harmonize. So there you have it. Oh, absolutely. Well, you'll always have this instrument, right? Uh, the throat, the singing. I hope so. Yeah, I've absolutely. been trying to get raspy the older I get, though, you know, because <laughs> when I when I was singing back in the folk days of the 60s, you know, the guys that were really making money were like, you know, Kenny Rogers. Yeah. <laughs> I'm hoping that the older I get, I get a little of that rasp in my voice now. Well, speaking of uh, Janis Joplin, I know uh, in the documentary she's mentioned quite a bit. Um, she had definitely quite the, the whiskey voice, uh, we would say, she right? Was. And talk about energy. Her energy was so big that it was hard to stay in the room with sometimes. Wow. Yeah. Wow. Yeah, I can believe that. I can yeah. believe that. And Absolutely. it was a little scary for me because, you know, I was like a kid too. We were both kind of about the same age. <clears throat> and when I met her, the night I met her, I was in town. Our group had been there for a while. And I knew that Albert had just signed Janice on. And I was thinking, okay, so I'm seeing this, this management is going from Peter, Paul and Mary and Ian and Sylvia from Canada who do traditional music and all these other people. And he, but then Bob Dylan, who then also was evolving as a folk artist. Um, and Janice was, you know, right in with it. When I think about it now, it didn't seem like it at the time, but she was emulating and doing blues a lot, which is a folk it's a folk, blues is folk music. I mean, the reason sure. I love folk is because of, I don't think there's any music that doesn't, it doesn't cross over into, that uh, it doesn't gotcha. use folk. Sure. Even sure. classical music 
is folk a lot. There are many pieces that are written on folk uh, melodies or what that have wow. been orchestrated, you know? Wow. I mean, folk's just everywhere. It's it's the ultimate everything music. You know, so. Wow. I, I never thought of it that way, uh, to be honest with you. That's cool. That's cool. Wow, you're so... Uh... You're so knowledgeable, honestly, about a lot of this stuff, right? I mean, you've been you just you've been in this for so long. I think that's does that still surprise people? You think when you're talking to you know, like, you know what I mean? Like they might talk to you like you don't you know you don't know what you're doing or this is new to you or something. Do you get any of that from the industry at this point, or everyone just sort of knows who Taylor well, Pye is and what she's done? I, I and think to that's to it. Her? You know, you know, I, I had to change my name, I think, because people were so who were fans of the Pozos were really so attached to that. And for me, I found changing your name, which, believe me, Taylor Swift was not the first one. <laughs> That's right. People out there, but I was. And here's the deal. One. I remember being in the Berkshires. I had moved from New York City. I was did a did like a decade in the city playing Olunnies and a lot of places there. I had deals with HGA Gold Star, but it fell through. I did commercials until I finally pissed a guy off one day because, you know, he comes out and tells me I'm singing a stay free mini pads commercial. And he's in front of me and he's like going, he's very excited. And he's waving his arms. And he's going, honey, honey, sweetie, sweetie. Look at me, look at me. What I need is what I need you to do. Can you sing this with a smile? And, you know, I was looking at him. I'm thinking, you're such a jerk. I said, have you ever had a period? Well, it's not fun. <laughs> and when I was That's a right. kid, it hurt me so bad. I was doubled over. They had to give me something called like paragoric, knock me out. Even at camp, it would happen. It was so unpleasant. And the guy turns around and walks off. And, you know, I never got <laughs> another call for a commercial. <laughs> <laughs> but I just couldn't see the exuberance. I get it. I you made, a, you not, made a great point. You I made a great point. I couldn't yeah. hold back on the truth. I hey, just listen. Went. No, I think that's what I really appreciate about you. And I'm sure a lot of people appreciate that about you. Like just, you know, going through the documentary and hearing your story. There, there's just a lot of points where you're... For instance, th this is actually a great thing to bring up. So Angel of the Morning, y'all, you, you guys had been asked to to record that song and hearing your explanation of what the song's about. I had never thought about that song in my life like that. And I was like, wait a second, that is what that song's about. Holy cow, okay, I get it. Like why you wouldn't want to sing that song, you know? Like it makes sense even back in that time for you to stick up like that. It's kind of a big deal, right? I mean, now it for somebody to do huge. that, it's not, oh, but mean, that's a huge deal mad. back then they were all mad at me and it was it was awful i mean i felt totally like like putting the stocks out in the middle of the square and everybody's staring at me now because you're such a freak you know sure. i thought what's freaky about that just saying that i don't feel like i mean i didn't explain it this much at that point because i don't think i even knew why i was doing it sure but i don't think i've ever been able to get away from my own sense of ethics and believe me it doesn't come from how i was religiously raised I discovered the art of motorcycle riding at an early age. I discovered the books like uh, um, About Love, but written by Eric Fromm. I began to read uh, Lao Tzu. I mean, I just, I was hungry for wisdom of our species. I was yeah. hungry to hear how other cultures must think because I was getting very disappointed in seeing in the 60s what was happening where we were. Sure. And I was tired of seeing my friends come home in boxes from Vietnam that had flags draped over them. I mean, there yeah. was just a lot going on that for my age to be in the limelight that I was beginning to feel. And the Pozos, we were more entertaining than we were political because the guys just weren't interested in that. And sure. I was. I was at the age where I wanted to talk about that. But That's the company went, no, no, you're pop, you know, and if you're pop, you can't get too, you can't get too that way you gotta like you know stay happy and positive all the time were you trying to maybe write some songs that were political or something or what was maybe 
your idea to just talk at concerts maybe in between songs that kind of thing or what were you thinking you no i wanted to record some like morning dew remember they did yeah. a little extra with that on the yeah. mike douglas show i was so yeah. happy that was one of our singles that i finally got to do a song that actually was talking about something going on which at the time was sure. acid ray you know walk me out in the morning do my honey yeah that's that was all about the acid rain but it was also about the radioactivity that could come from the rain that could change oh, wow. our lives because our environment and you know this precedes today but here we are folks so you're way ahead of your time taylor really i mean that it's like when i see that that that's what i think i think you're way there's just some people in life when you look back they were ahead of their time and you're one of those type of people like for sure you're just thinking wow. way, way ahead of your time. So is that good or bad, Patrick? I, I see that as a, <laughs> as a very good thing, actually. Uh, to be thank you, with you, thank you, because yeah. I've, I've often wondered sometimes, like, well, dang it, I missed that one again, you know? <laughs> or I got here too early. <laughs> I always said I was born in the wrong, like I lived in the wrong uh, era. Like I, I feel like. Um, I would have thrived in the 60s and 70s. I was born in 79, you know, uh, but I feel like if I, w I don't know, it's just like my, I, I relate to that counterculture in that time. And, you know, looking back, like I just relate to it a lot, um, to be honest with you, you know? Well, that thank you. Like, yeah. I relate to the music of that time because sure. even if you take the, like the young bloods who, when the rock came into the folk and it was, come on people now, smile yeah. on, I sing each other instead of brother. Cause I said, let's be inclusive. The next step <laughs> forward, you know, when I sing it, I say each other, wow. you know, I change it wow. to gender free, all natural. Let's just, you know, do it like it Love is. That. Just our species Love guys. That. Who cares sure. about what color you are? I don't care what church you went to. Are you a member of our species? Let's talk about that. You know, if we could get to that kind of language, maybe it would heal some of the dissension and the division that's so popular with so many people these days. I don't know. I'm working at it. No, you're right. Hey, you're doing we we all need to be more like you. That is the truth. You know, uh, yes, I, I, I couldn't that. agree with that more. I couldn't agree <laughs> with that more. I heard a quote recently that I've been it's kind of become my mantra recently, I'd say over the last year, and I'm going to continue it, which is um, don't don't uh, kill what you hate, uh, save what you love. <laughs> so spend your time trying to save what you love. Don't try to get out there and take down the things you hate or just, you know, it's like get out there and love and show love and bring people together and get out there and save what you want. Be proactive um, about that. I just like that. I like that attitude. Um, just bringing more love into this world and, you know, trying to bring people yeah. together. Yep. Yeah. I'm all about it. There's, Absolutely. there's you, you, Ruby Lovett is in the, in the film and I'm so yeah. happy about that because I've known Ruby for over 20 years when she had a deal on curb and I first met her, I was writing, uh, with some people from Forerunner Music and they eventually signed her and they signed me too. And then they sold out to someone else. But during that time, we did a lot of writing together and I really loved writing with Ruby because she's so interesting. She's from Laurel, Mississippi. And she told me stories that just raised the hair on the back of my neck. I, I couldn't even imagine. I said, oh, child, oh, child. What From where she grew up and what things were yeah, like. Yeah, yeah. The things yeah. now that she questioned in life, the things that she sure. was having to deal with in her own psyche and spirit is one of our species who saw this and thinks her daddy might have done that or, you know, and sure. and when we, you know, she come in, it was never a hard to find a subject because it was her life was like you were saying, it was just so full. I could just sit and listen for a minute and a guitar riff would come into my head and I could start something or get a line going. And one day it was like, uh, you say you're gonna close a book of love because it never seems to stick around. And that's kind of how it started out. But then the verse, the chorus got into because you've got to love yourself before you can love, really love anybody else. That's your that's number right. one thing. And that's it's not right. that ego thing. It's our ability to say, I love you, man. Yeah, that was a mistake. Okay, forward, forward. Stay that's with right. the good energy. It's not be a Pollyanna and don't see the bad, but don't let sure. it drag you down. Don't Correct. become it. Because you can never defeat evil with evil. It just doesn't work. The evil just That's gets right. bigger. That's bigger. right. That's right. Yeah. It keeps it's like the end the it's the endless one hand on top of the other. It'll never win, right? It'll never stop if evil never. versus evil. Um, It'll yeah, kill everything at some point if if Correct. we don't stop, if the yeah. light doesn't get through, right? 
Yeah. I know that all right. sounds sort of metaphysical, but Hey, listen, I'm all about it. Um, I agree with that stuff. I'm not a religious person, but I'm a very, I'm a humanist, you know, I'm all about our species or just people. My, yeah, my what I too. see, what I, you know, what's around me, my people, um, I'm very Texan that way uh, myself, which I think is, um, I think there's a lot of Texans like us, uh, to be honest with you, like this, right? I actually think that's a very Texan way to be in a lot of ways. Um, I don't think Texans get that, um, la fama de eso. Like, we don't get, uh, I don't even know how to say that in English. Like, we don't get that reputation. Uh, yes. You know what I mean? Texans don't get yes. that kind of reputation. You kidding me? Not even in America, right? We have stereotypes from other states about who we are as Texans, um, <laughs> right? I mean forget the rest of the world we got to worry about uh, our neighbors uh as well so you know what i haven't brought up real quick i want to make sure i mention this i i do a separate intro which i'll bring up the the doc and some of uh, you know other information about it but who who are all the members of the of the peso seco singers well in the beginning the original group was loft and klein and don williams donnie williams back in those days he was donnie um and me, three yeah. of us. Yeah. And Paul Butts, who I'd been in a, uh, a group with who was part of the Corpus Christi Folk Music Society, became our manager. But Paul played in a group with me and a bass player, Danny Johnson, I think was that, who ended up playing with the Pozos on the first, on that Edmark record cut of time. And he became our manager and totally just backed up and said if albert grossman wants to sign you kids go you know i mean paul was the oldest one of us and and married at the time and uh and he just was a great guy i i hope he's still out there somewhere i've been thinking about trying to get a hold of him to see if he could come to corpus when i come down in march i'd love to see him again if he's out there anybody know if paul's around send him my direction i'd love to see <laughs> paul again absolutely yeah he was great those guys sort of were they were the guys who had the who knew somebody who had a little record company over in the um you know port aransas area over that way somewhere out that way and that's how the ed mark records and um, he, he really got that whole ball started for us as a group. And, and what happened with that record, that little lead mark record is some, it became a regional hit. So immediately the group was making like a little extra money, at, still working our jobs. Don sure. was working for PPG chemical and I was going to school. I just enrolled in Del Mar that fall. And I don't remember what Lofton was doing, but he was doing something out there. And then when we, when the next year, when the record went number one in LA and then it's just drifting off the charts in LA, went number one in Chicago, and it's drifting off the charts in Chicago, it's number one in Boston, but never all at once, which killed wow. us as a group that would have had more longevity. But Columbia, because it was, I think, already transitioning toward what was going on in San Francisco, they dropped the ball. They didn't really we would get to places to play and the kids at the schools college concerts were the way you made your living uh, would say where can we get your record and we'd go what yeah the record store here in town doesn't have it You're and like, i remember going to clive davis's office and saying why do students that were at the school playing why are our records not in there you know because we weren't important anymore they were already moving away from the folk stuff wow I know it. It was just like sickening. Uh, but crazy. anyway, well, no, it's crazy. one of those things that I learned about big business. And I said, you know, sure. when I when I wanted to start a record company, uh, the people that were going to help out, and they said, well, you're the only one who really knows about a record company. I said, oh, yeah. And what I know, you don't want to do. So we wouldn't do it that way anyway. In the first place, let's don't sign artists. Let's do projects and fund people who don't have the money to do a project. Or help mm. them and let's archive some good stuff and let's keep it folk acoustic. Let's keep it something that makes it worth something at some point. Because so to me, especially now, think about it, Patrick, with the AI stuff the way it is. Yeah. Who knows how long acoustic music will really hang in here? It's a great question. I actually was going to bring that up to you where you thought folk music was nowadays and how its popularity compares to back then. You, you could argue this is weird. You could argue there's way more folk music now out and about, right? More artists writing folk, more that, but it's probably not as popular as it was back then. I mean, are there folk songs in the top 10? I don't think I've ever heard one. 
right? And I don't even know when. I, I honestly not lately. I'm thinking Tracy Chapman was the last one who really hit into the, oh, man. Into yeah, the big that's, radio. And that's absolutely. pure folk, She's man. I was so happy when I heard her album. I went, yes, you see, guys, folk never is that's dead. A, it are you talking died. about um what was that uh, uh my favorite one was mountains of things which was great sociological comment okay, big yeah. time and then across across the tracks separates the whites and the blacks i mean when i first heard that song i just like i it took my breath away i went yes woman thank you thank you i just remember her right baby i got your number Oh yeah, she yeah I mean, she started doing uh, stuff like that. I, I love stuff that stuff. But I never heard any. I didn't hear any of the early stuff. Now I need to go check it out. See, I'm here. Yeah, her first you. album yeah. got big on campus because of the I didn't students. Know that. She was one of, yeah, yeah. That first album had all these political social commentaries. Wow. Which, coming from a young black woman, we were like, yeah. I kept saying yes, sister. Because when I lived in the Berkshires, I was getting the feeling of, you know, after being a, a white woman in the industry and seeing how women are treated in the music industry, uh, I said, you know, and, in, and, and basically in the paparazzi industry, uh, even movies, women are treated sure. very differently. Sure. I mean, I think in life, that guy's name, the big even producer just in who had the line and in and out of his room, you got to sleep with me or you got to do whatever, you know, sure. to get in here. That just was so common. Not that it doesn't happen to men, because I know it does, but it's really almost every, if you're a good looking woman, it's, it's a curse. Sure. No, And absolutely. if you're not, you're not going to so. ask you anyway to be a big star anymore. I mean, it's just, it's yeah, all gotten stinks, about right? the facade rather than, I mean, Roy Orbison was never a, a handsome fellow in a lot of ways. But I'm thinking, but look at the voice today. Would he be popular? I don't know. It's a great so, question. That's a great question. Um, well, I, I mean, I don't, you know, I've definitely had this discussion with a lot of artists and singers and musicians like back in the day, you could argue some people say like, you know, back in the day, you, you really had to have a talent. You really had to sing. You really had to play the instrument. I mean, you really had to, you know, harmonize and all this stuff. And now well, there's technology that can help you along the way. So there's some artists that, you know, rise to the top that potentially don't have that chops, but they have these other things that the record company sees as this is what we can market. We can make you big off of this talent. We'll manufacture that, you know, <laughs> we'll, we'll make that happen for you. And I don't know, could you get away with that back, you know, 50s, 60s, you know, 70s? I don't know. Oh, I think, I think people did. I think there were a lot of copycats, you know, Elvis, copycat people with Elvis. Sure. Uh, all groups with the yeah. Beatles. You know, look at yeah. all the groups that came out that didn't start wearing the same uniforms, and they did pretty good because they copycatted. True. But, but they could play the instruments and sing and stuff, right? Like legitimately. Yes, well, and we didn't have the synthesizers. Were still. That's I what I mean. Yeah. Guy in New York. Exactly. I was living in New York City when a guy said, "Check this out," and he no brought way. over the synthesizer. <laughs> I'd never seen one, and he was going. Woo, 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 was that in the eighties or when was oh, that? It was like the eighties, yeah. Early eighties, yeah. Early 80s, yeah. The apartment. I was living in in New York in the eighties. I didn't really move to the Berkshires to about mid mid eighties, and it was great going up there because you could make I could do just as a fellow folk, folk singer or soloist uh, within a fifty mile radius of where I lived there in Stockbridge, right in the heart of of the Berkshires. I could pull in a thousand dollars a month, and I didn't need more than that to live up there in the eighties. And it, I lived in a fabulous, beautiful place. I mean, it's, wow, it's, that's it's awesome. a real, it was a, a great, real special place. That's so cool. And in the <laughs> winter, all the tourists left, and it was like <laughs> wonderful. <laughs> Get out of here, tourists! It was great. It was great. That's yeah. awesome. It, it, yeah, what was that synthesizer time. coming out? I'm curious what you thought of that and the sound. Like, what were you thinking? Uh, it was kind of scary to me. I thought, ooh, I hope that doesn't get popular because that will eliminate <laughs> a lot of people's jobs. Well, you were wrong about that, Taylor. You were wrong. <laughs> there you go. Uh, it's literally the 80s sound, right? When you hear the sit, you're like 80s. Oh, oh, yeah. You, oh, you yeah. immediately oh, yeah. just think there. 80s. He said, this is the next thing. And he was right. He said, this is where music is going. And it is where pop music is going. But that's Correct. what I mean about folk. I'm hoping that folk will always be here. And I'm hoping that you're folk right. Money really, that we have preserved some classic performances of acoustic musicians who wrote sure. this song or this or they're giving you their yeah. best on this song and they nailed it that's yeah. what i'm looking for those performances that are so special no one ever tops wow. it regardless of how good the cut is it was the performance that was so great because it was live that's amazing no that's amazing um you know there are still 
I lived in Austin for seven years. I'm up in Dallas now. I moved here two years ago. Um, but when I was in Austin, my goodness, yes, there, there are so many people out doing folk and just, you know, guitar, my boy, these are my songs, yeah. hear me out, you know, and I love that. And it never died, just gets bigger. I still know a lot of people that play at the Kerrville um, Folk Festival, which I love. I've never gone to it. I really want to go to that um, one time and, and see that. Um, but yeah, I, I'm with you. I hope that kind of music never dies. I mean. Me too. Um, so I, that's yeah. what I'm promoting. I'm promoting folk Absolutely. everywhere I can. And, of course. and folk, uh, folk DJs are the only group folk on DJs. national. Well, there are, there's a whole list of folk DJs. And I work with Nancy Dillon out in Seattle because she's been around these guys forever, knows a lot of them still by first name. And it's a it's an older generation. I was going to ask any new ones up and coming, you know, not any that I can think of right now. But we're talking about that and saying, how can we as the you know, we're on the other end of the spectrum here. So how do we get some of these younger guys to like I got a good friend up in Rochester who has a great show called Open Tunings, but he hasn't registered to be a folk DJ, which means that then they report in what they're playing. So it gives a chart to folk music. It's actually there is one. Sure. But most people don't pay attention to it. So Puff Money Records, we've been supporting that as best we can in, in the national awesome. public radio arena. And we keep telling people, you know, there are stations that do shows that are all about folk. Uh, and they come out of Massachusetts. And the Northeast is still uh, much more receptive to folk music than a lot of. That's one of the reasons I moved there after my Nashville thing was when I could see that. It was really changing, even taking at some point when what happened to Ruby as a traditional country artist, I, you know, she stopped getting a deal, stopped getting interest because she was too traditional country. Now it's what? something so else. Crazy, it's right? pop country. Yeah. And then when you, when you attach that pop label to to the beginning of it. I mean, I liked it back in our day because we were real popular with the kids and, and it would have probably enabled us had we been able to survive the changes. Um, but I really like the idea that you've got to keep something traditional, like all future albums or projects on Puff Money. I'd like to see at least one song be a public domain folk song. That's wow. your version. You nail it. You make it whatever you want. And then That's you copyright so cool. it because you can sure. copyright your own arrangement of a public domain song. We did it sure. in the 60s all the time. Sure. Um, it's how Peter, Paul and Mary and all the bigger name groups that got extra income by doing that, by, you know, making this is our arrangement of this public domain song. But it means you get to get the money off your record anyway. Sure. In that I think that's fair. I mean, you do I do too. That's what and, I tell. Right? Yeah. That's what we do as a company. I go, I don't know. We're going to pay you your publishing money. You'll get paid. And we're only going to pitch to folk DJs because that's what we're looking for. So think about that when you want to do a project because they're interested in acoustic music. People who actually sit down with an instrument and can sing and play for you in a living room and maybe blow you away with their song. Okay, so, so technically you could you you couldn't be a folk singer if you just if you sang with an electric guitar only i don't know why not because i remember going and seeing light at hopkins and he was tearing me up going i got my baby boy. Yeah. You know? and tony <laughs> joe white a lot of the time man was just playing his electric down at the embers and corporate well they might call it blues and i know you exactly. say focus blues but some but most people may folk. not i'm with you i agree yeah, right but yeah, do you think you most go. people separate it who aren't musicians or just you know regular people yeah, right yeah they, they don't, do they separate don't, it right yeah, yeah yeah if we could just get everybody to see when you're talking anything that's like a root kind of music it's yeah folk good call because it's good of call. the people the people you know it's the same i would just when people didn't have such a bad look on their face when you go oh i play folk and they go sure oh. yeah <laughs> <laughs> It's sad. It hurts our feelings, guys. Stop I get that. it. I get it. It's um. I wonder what they imagine. Just like a few people in a in a, a field of flowers, just just <laughs> you know, singing to the sun, and you know, like I don't know. And they're just like, I don't know about that. But it's like, no, that that's not. I mean, yes, that could be folk, but that could be any music. Let's be real. Um, no, folk is just probably from the heart, an original song. Um, I don't know. What what would you really define? 
folk as if you had to, you know, you meet an alien species, right? And they ask you, what is folk music? What, what are you well, going I think to tell them? It's It's got to be acoustic in nature in some way, which means it's involving the human voice because it could be folk and be acapella. Ah, okay. I love this. Yeah. That's so cool. Okay. Yeah. I like your definition. Okay. Yeah. That's probably it. Just has to be acoustic in nature in some sense. Wow. What a great acoustic in nature. Yeah. You just brought that down to a little, you should be the person if aliens come, we're sending Taylor pie. She can communicate to them and help us. Yeah. Uh, I can poke them up just like everybody yeah. else. <laughs> <laughs> oh I folked them up. I love it. I'm, ste I'm, I'm stealing that. I'll everybody I came for. I'll leave the planet. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> I'm stealing that. That's so funny. Oh, too, Patrick. Uh, Pass it on. Pass it I on. I love it. That is, oh, that is great. <laughs> that is great. Oh, like I said, you have such a great um, energy. Who, who are some folk artists right now that you would like people to know about or to check out? that are listening and watching? Well, this. I still listen to Tracy and I always check out and see what she's doing uh, off and on. And I love, I love Annie, like I said, Annie McHugh, her stuff uh, ranges the range because she did an album that w uh, won some jazz awards. But oh, really? to, to me, you wow. see jazz is folk also wow. because it's, a lot, you know, when you think about it, that's really acoustic music, especially if you go to a little jazz club somewhere. Oh, guys 100%. Are I mean, that's folk too. It's, it's, it's kind of an attitude thing. If people could see that this kind of music and not that electronic music couldn't maybe become folk, but I'm not hearing any yet that I would really label as folk. It seems to that's me that electronic music really got, got popular when it became in the disco era where the lights are flashing and there's so much going on. All, all of your sensories are yeah, over, that's overwhelmed. A good point. That's yeah. a good point. Yeah, that, and, that really is it. Yeah, that's a good point. Yeah. Folk maybe distinguishes, it, right? It helps you. It is because people listen. Even yeah. if it's jazz, they're sitting in there and they're listening. They're yeah. not just like tuning it out. So if you go yeah. in a room and you hear some kind of music, regardless of what it is, I think, if the audience is listening to me, that must be some kind of folk music going on in good there because otherwise music. they wouldn't be listening like that. Sure. You know, now that you mention it, um, I had a uh, Marsha Ball on. I don't know if you know who that is. I do, and, yeah. And she um, she played a couple songs on her piano on the podcast. Uh -huh. And I gotta say, now that you say what you just said, like that was kind of folky. It was, yeah. it was pretty. It was folky. Like it was. I it was amazing. Totally first consider of all. her a, her a folk musician in in the perfect right. Absolutely. She's amazing. Yeah, she was. She blew my mind away. Uh, to be honest with you, I never seen anybody play piano like that. Um, I was blown away. She was amazing. Yeah. I'm curious what you think about Uncle Walt's band. What are they considered? I think they've got a folk root somewhere. They, they investigate a lot of different areas that would be that's a little bluegrass. Sometimes you feel yeah. like you're getting mm -hmm. and, a, yeah. and a little a garage band feel sometimes. Yeah. yeah, I could see that too. You're right. Yeah. Because I had... um. I had David Ball on and we talked about Uncle Walt's band. They released like a anniversary album. So we, we got to, you know, have him on and talk about that. And, and he, he was, you know, sort of wondering himself what, what kind of band they were, you know, it's like, I don't know. How should we label pitch ourselves? Us. Yeah. He was like, I don't know how to label ourselves, you know? Um, and I guess, you know, that, that actually brings up a good point. You know, it's probably no matter what you label yourselves, everyone else is going to label you what they want. Exactly. You know, at the end of the day, you can label yourself one way, but at the end of the day, people are just going to label you whatever they want, you know? So at really at the end of the day, it doesn't matter. Do your thing. It comes from your heart, right? It makes you happy. It fills you. Um, it spreads some love. Um, and you do that. And I think music and an instrument and an audience is just goes back to it's so primitive for us, right? Just sitting around a campfire, no big communities. I mean, we're talking, yeah. I, I bet they were doing music hundreds of thousands of years ago around fires, making sounds, right? Folk, literally original folk, just yes. like poetry, right? Just something. Yeah. That they, and that's so cool to me. Like that, that is so cool. So in some ways, like folk is literally like the oldest 
form of music. It um, is, so along I, with drum drumming. See? Yeah. So drum wow. was probably the first instrument. We think something rhythmic. So they got a That's rhythm a good going. Point. And then yeah. the chanting of the voice, you yeah. know. Great. I loved I loved hanging out Thought with the Namioho Ringe Killers for a while because I, I decided that chanting would be really good to build up your vocal chops, you know, and I was okay. right. About it. I mean, wow. you, if, and then I got to go to the big temple in Boston and I built my own Busadon, which is what you put your Gohans in the, the scroll thing they put in there. And I, I like did dovetails. I knew a, a woodmaker up in the Berkshires who let me use his dovetail saw. And I did it all by hand and put it all together and put my Gohans in it. But sitting in the Boston, wow. in the big temple there for the Nichiren Shoshu people, these guys that were chanting were looked, they looked like sumo wrestlers. And when they would go, no, I mean, the air around you would vibrate. I just sort of sat there in awe. Wow. Wow. This is the power of chanting. And in the early days, the, with drumming, that's what they had, their voices, to really use the voice in that way. You could, Because you could change the tone of your voice. And just like sure. breaking a glass, if you sonically could do it, I guess some people might be able to do that with their actual, just your vocal cords. So. Yeah, no, that's that's fascinating. I mean, yeah. That's it. That's it. I mean, those were the first instruments, the drums and then the voice and yeah. bring it all together. And then someone said, you know what? I'm going to tell a story now over this while you're doing that, right? While you're chanting and you got the drums. Now I'm telling a story over here. And then that turned into, well, I'm going to sing that story, I bet. And then that became a go. song, right? First hit song around, uh, you know, amongst the cavemen. Right? You That's know, it. Passing around a, a record or something. That would have been hilarious back then. There was record labels back in the caveman days. Right? Yeah, we thought vinyl weighed a lot. Man, yeah. that's so funny. <laughs> I don't know why they brought vinyl back, yeah. guys. Did you get that, that new record? Yeah. Yeah. Those things weigh big, a ton, man. Big rock. Just, you got to hear this tune. No, wait, that's just the first track. Bring in the others. <laughs> <laughs> oh that's funny oh my goodness wow that's great so what's on the uh what's on the agenda for 2023 for you taylor you got this documentary that's um it's available now but they're going to be showing it on Tux texas public uh television here pretty soon but you, people can see it now so yeah what's the what's the plans for 2023 what are you thinking well I'm going to stick with the documentary for a while and keep writing and, and working with other people and looking for more projects to put on the, on the little record label. Um, but I, I'd like to stick with the documentary for a little while longer because taking it and maybe take it to some more folk alliances. Uh, uh, I also brought it to the Southwest Folk Alliance last fall. And after showing it, I, usually hang around and say if you got any questions you want to talk about it and sure. that has been a really wonderful experience for me especially when I finally had a couple of guys come up and tell me you know I know and one of them I had had in a song swarm I because I thought he was so great and I loved his songs and he's a really good player but you know he has he's like I was for a lot of years of my life where you take other jobs so you can support your musical habit Sure. And he he's, keeps thinking, you know, he'll get a somebody will cut a song. Somebody I'm going to make the money from my song, you know, and and same way with the other guy. And they said, you know, what we really liked about what you did, Pi, was that you made me realize that are we doing it for that or am I just doing it because I love it? And I said, well, if you really just love it, then it doesn't matter about the rest. Yes, you'd like to have it. But at some point you realize that's not really why I'm doing what I'm doing. I'm doing it because I love doing this. That's why I'm doing it. And when that sinks in, it gets a whole lot easier because the rest really doesn't matter. I said, but I will tell you this. It's very wise if you take jobs to learn things that you'd like to know. Like I worked for three years in a cabinet shop at five bucks an hour learning how to build cabinets so that someday I could make my own and make them really good. You know, yeah. things like that. And you have probably, right? You probably have the best cabinet. I'm now working on it because I actually am building a little house above my farmhouse, which is a, not, is 100 years old now. And it's it took six inches of creek water three years ago. And uh, the dry rot's getting pretty bad. You know, some of the floors oh, kind of buckle. 
So yeah, move up the hill where the barn is, a uh, higher ground. I think a lot of us are in that boat these days, sure. looking for higher uh, places to anchor. Yeah, that's sure. it. Where where are you uh, located right now? Are you in uh, Texas or are you up in Nashville? Uh, I'm living about 60 miles southeast of Nashville in the foothills of the Cumberland Mountains. Oh, and wow. what drew me to this part of the world wow. was the music of Appalachia. I sure it's that thing of always remembering how it would be, you know, to hear a, uh, someone singing on the edge of a, you know, looking out the mountains, just singing into the echo of the mountain, just a cappella or yodeling that I thought was the anchor of what folk is in your spirit. You know, that's the spirit you're carrying when you commit yourself, wow. I think, to that. That's amazing. Well, I have two more questions um, and we'll, we'll end. So I, one, I just wanted to find out like what, what the best thing you think you got out of this documentary for yourself. And then the last thing I was hoping you would end on is just telling us the, um, cause I just think it's a great story. The leaving on a jet plane story with, you know, John Denver, like how that all came. I just love that story. I think that'd be a cool way to end it. Uh, but yeah, I'd be curious just what you, you know, what do you think you got out of this documentary the most? I mean, you obviously invested a lot of time. They followed you around a lot, you know, probably helped with maybe the final edit a little bit, at least gave some notes. Um, so, you know, it's a very personal project for you and people are learning a lot about you. Um, yeah, I'm just curious what, you know, what you got out of it the most. Um, I think I am most pleased to like who I am after I saw what other people, um, once we sort of got clear that maybe if you want to put my family in it and they don't want to be in it, then they had the right to not be in it. And nobody wanted to sign on to be in it with me. So I was kind of stuck with those people following me around for all that. Time. <laughs> but I felt like that's fair. So a lot of writing had to kind of get changed around for what the scenes would be and all that. And that's kind of how we ended up with the folk alliances. And I said, well, we got a lot of people there. And, and that's what I love to do. And that's that's what I'd like to see. But the little stories and the vignettes in between and then hearing what other people tell me, like after showing it to a group at a folk alliance or something, and then they come back and talk to me about it. That's given me this whole new and also talking to you today, Patrick, because you said some things to me today that just they fill my heart with this great joy that, well, I'm not a religious person either. Um, I'm. I feel like I'm deeply spiritual because I love our species. I love our planet. I, I love everything that we've been gifted on this planet. And I feel like that's part of being, being a folk person is that that's my true love, not all the technology, which is cool. It's helpful to us. I love the fact that people can have legs if they don't have legs and learn how to walk on. There's so many good things about our technology. I just would like for us to preserve some things that I feel this film, if that makes people feel it's worth it to have that kind of ethical culture within you, that that sort of out, out shows and outshines anything that's religious or cultural in a way that you might think makes your group better than another group because we're all the same species. And that's, that's where I hope we can move our language and I think folk does that too, you know, as the folk minstrels used to travel from town to town singing, and yesterday in Johnston town he came in with the rifle, you know, they would carry the message of the day to the next group. And yeah. then a song would get switched, and, and that's folk music too. It, it all has to evolve. It's not going to stay the same. But wow. I think that's what it's done for me is to be able to see myself from a distance and still like me. It's like, oh, okay, I'm okay. <laughs> and still like me, I love it. What a great answer. Um, you're so amazing. What a, what a great, insightful answer, honestly. Um, yeah, that, that's probably how I would have felt about something like that. If uh, no one's ever gonna make a documentary on me, first of all, but if they did, yeah, that, that's, I guess I would just be, I guess my biggest fear at my age, I'm 43, um, is when I get to the end of my life, am I going, you know, what am I going to be thinking about? Right. And what my father passed away five years ago, he taught me a lesson, which was Patrick. He said on his deathbed to me, um, look, at this point in my life, I'm not looking back and thinking, oh, I did this wrong. I did this wrong. I did this. It's more just the things I didn't do that I regret, you know, that I didn't go for. 
I didn't, you know, give it my all. So, so my whole life from that point has just been just go for things, you know, say yes, give it a try, try this, expand your mind. Don't be afraid to do this or do that. Because when I look back, I, I, that's what I want. I, I don't want to have those sort of um, regrets, uh, you know, so I want to be pleased with myself in the end, I guess, is, is, is where you're at, right? That, that sort of enlightenment. Um, yes, great. yes. And it do, you don't have to achieve anything in particular sure. other than being yeah, exactly. maybe a good neighbor. You look like sure. a good neighbor. I'd love to have yeah. you for a neighbor. Yeah, I think I'm a good yeah. person. I, I care about the people around me. I, you know what it is? I make a conscious choice to be a good person in a lot of ways. You know, I, it, it, it's important to me my family, my friends, the people around me, uh, professionally, whatever it may be, just a stranger, my name, you know, my neighbor, when I go walk my dog or whatever. Um, yeah, I think community can get lost um, sometimes. And it is important to remember, like you said, we're all in this together. <laughs> um, Completely. You know, Boy, so, if people don't get that now, I don't know what else we can you're do. You're right. Or That's a great community. point. I mean, you're right. After the pandemic, hello, that should show us all. We are all in this together. Um, Yes. And if not, nature yeah. will force it on us, right? To be all in this together. That's the uh, word from the Weather Channel is that, yeah. <laughs> well, with the way the seas are warming, folks, we will continue to see these storms get bigger and bigger. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. 100%. That's it. So we need to stick together because we actually may need more of us to survive. So that's a great point. That's a great point. Yes, absolutely. So love your neighbor. Yes, love your neighbor. All right, Taylor. Well, what do you think about ending on this cool um, uh, John Denver story? Right? Is this not a John Leaving Denver story? on a jet plane. Yeah. We'll just take him. Oh boy, that was great. I loved John. He was so much fun. <laughs> and we we told him we were going to cut his song, and we'd been hanging out all afternoon. So we decided to go to dinner, and John and I were having a couple of glasses of wine together. And I think we had a little too much wine, maybe, <clears throat> because we, <laughs> when we got to the studio and i'm all excited about cutting john's song we loved his song we had all our parts done and it was always good but just having a little trouble kind of getting that pitch in certain places you know this will when you relax your vocal cords too much mm, could like kind of slip off a little yeah, bit so then okay. we were laughing about it but we got it all worked out without the having to change it you know they, na they now make a machine that can fix all that. <laughs> but back then, you actually had to sing it right. Yeah. So I had to struggle with it a little bit. But I did my part, got it. Everybody was happy. It was, was, a, was a wrap. And then the next day, we all get up and we're all excited about it. And we find out that Peter, Paul, and Mary had cut it the very same night as we were cutting it for our label i think i can't remember what label they were warner brothers i think they were on they were cutting it over at warner brothers and of course they were a much bigger group than we were so we knew that that was a toast for us so we never even got to release it i wonder if it's still somewhere in the can i'd love to hear it Anybody i was gonna ask it? you that i was gonna ask yeah you i don't i don't have a copy of it i mean it's somewhere wow. in there maybe oh if they even gosh. kept it because it was Imagine huge but you know that. when i heard when i heard mary's version i went this is the right version because she did you hear it first on the radio or did you hear it before it got released i never heard it until it was on the radio and it didn't take them long i think it, they released it like within a week or two after that but i was re oh, also wow. really happy for john because that really zoomed his career straight upward for that as a as a writer and of course everything else was history for him what a sure. sweet fellow he was he was That's really awesome. good friends with ron shaw who took lofton klein's place in the group oh really Mm, wow. In fact, Ron, Ron and his twin brother, Rick, from New Hampshire, when, when John uh, had the accident in the plane out west, yeah. they, flew, they flew to Denver. They were, they were some of the people that were personally invited to uh, oh, wow. attend because, you know, the whole world couldn't come even though we wanted to. Sure. No, that was a tragedy uh, yeah. for sure. He was, yeah, a, he was a good guy. He was one of the better guys in the business that I got to know there and was a gentleman and a, and a really sweet soul. That's great to hear. That, that really is. That's great to hear. What a great story. And what a, what a phenomenal life you've led and are still continuing to lead. Um, Thank you. I think so. Yes, absolutely. Are you kidding me? You got stories for days. For, for days. Years. I got to Texas. We got to yeah. hook up. Yes, absolutely. <laughs> Please. Anytime till I'm down. I, hey, I love uh, the vino as well. 
So, okay. uh, you know, I heard you in the, in the uh, documentary, who wants sangria? <laughs> So Listen, I, I, lived, I lived right. in Spain for years, so I'm a big fan of sangria. Oh, all right. We have to yes. talk about my walking trip to Spain back when I was 67. I Wait, like such a did you do the Camino? No, I didn't do the big one. I just walked everywhere with a friend of mine. We, we took backpacks. See that? Oh, you got the oh, you got the mark of the man. That's it. I did yeah. it. I no, did it. Didn't do that one, but we just went everywhere we went. We took either buses or trains. Once we got out, we were there for three weeks and we carried our I figured I could I worked up to 30 pounds on my backpack, but everything we lived in for three weeks was in the backpack, you know. And yeah. that was a really great experience of yeah. just how little we need to actually survive i concur wow i mean you basically that's the camino too the camino is done in a lot of different ways but you're basically describing uh people that i saw in the camino doing that exact uh, same sort yeah. of scenario um look i get it i mean when i did it i was 30 best shape of my life and it was tough like right. really tough right. you know i'm walking 40 kilometers a day with my pack and yeah, it, it, it took me six weeks, you know, a group of us. So, oh. I mean, it, it, it was rough, you know, it was 650 miles or something. Um, yeah, it was crazy. Um, yeah, yeah, amazing um, experience. The, the Spanish countryside is just, I actually don't even know my own country that well because I've yeah. never walked it that like that. You know what I mean? Like every yeah. nook and cranny from the border of France, Roncesvalles is where I started all the way to Santiago de Compostela. And I actually walked to Finisterra, which means end of the earth, right? At that time, that was the Atlantic Ocean right there was called uh, Finisterra, which is, that's where they came. That, they thought the earth ended there. They just yeah. thought, well, if you go out there, you ain't coming back. I off think the edge. That, yeah, you're off the edge. And I, and I find that fascinating. I remember finishing, just standing there looking out, thinking, wow, people used to come here and, and just think, that's it? That's the edge. The same way we look at space, they looked at the ocean like that. And I find that fascinating, which brings me to my last point I'll make, you know, one day that that reality will break too, right? Of what's beyond that. Um, yes. right. We'll figure that out one day. I, I, mean, I hope uh -huh. I'm alive for it. I'm all about that stuff. Me too. So, so anyway, well, Taylor, this has been amazing. I got to tell you again, I love your energy so much. Um, I can't get enough of it. I'm all about that. And I, yeah, you're just such a, a ball of like beautiful positive energy that you spread to everyone around you and, and and you're contagious with it which is great it's like a good virus you know it's awesome i i love it i i wish you the best and then yeah you have lucky friends they're lucky they're lucky that you you are their friend thank you i can't choose one now patrick thank oh you. man Kidding me? You're, gonna, you're gonna make me tear up here too. You've been listening to the Lone Star Plate Podcast with your host, Patrick Scott Armstrong. For more info, go to lonestarplate.show.